My name is Yatsu. I'm chairman and co-founder of Animoca Brands. And it is a great pleasure for me to be here to discuss the future, the metaverse, non-fungible tokens, and what it might mean to games and our future digital lives. Just quickly, a little bit about Animoca Brands. Animoca Brands is a company that is really about developing true digital property rights. We've been basically building in the space for the last four or so years, starting in the earliest deals um, with uh, a partnership with CryptoKitties back in the day. Uh, we've made over 100 investments in the non-fungible token and blockchain gaming space, including companies such as Sky Mavis, the creators of Axie Infinity, as well as you know being the owners of the Sandbox, of Rev, um, you know, investors in OpenSea, in Dapper Labs, in Bitsky, in Wax, in Decentraland, and as I said earlier, probably in 100 others more, and over eight metaverses that we're building ourselves. And quickly talking about sort of what the topic is here all about, let's start off with the definition of the metaverse. In fact, probably all of you will have already heard of the metaverse in some form and fashion, especially after Facebook basically tried to coin themselves as meta basically trying to own the term, but also Microsoft and of course Roblox and Epic and just every other company out there is now trying to figure out the metaverse strategy. So what in fact is the metaverse and what might it mean? And if you take a look at, for instance, the amount of time that we already spend online today, you know, basically most of the time in things like social media, Twitter, Facebook. And if you also consider the fact that of the 3.2 billion people who are already playing games on a very regular basis around the world, spending, you know, most of their uh, sort of casual, yeah, sort of evening times playing fun and exciting games. Actually, one might argue that we are already in a kind of metaverse. After all, what are you doing first thing in the morning? And what are you doing before you go to bed? Very likely you're interacting with a digital device that is connecting you to some kind of virtual experience whether this is sharing a photo on Instagram, whether this is playing a game on your iPhone or on your PC. So one could argue that we're already in a kind of metaverse today. But the question is, who owns this metaverse in fact? And in fact, who owns control of it? And perhaps the bigger question is, who owns your data? So let's talk a little bit about data. Because today, perhaps the most valuable of resources is no longer something that you dig from the ground even though it may still be precious to some. If you consider, for instance, what it really meant for the people in society before, you were valuing things that were scarce by resources based on access to land, for instance, because you were able to extract resources from it. But today, the world's most valuable resource is data. And what's interesting about data is that this data, this particular resource, comes from our headspace, from our idea space, from our minds, in fact. And it actually comes from the scarcest of resources, which is our time, the time that we have to live on Earth here. But one of the other things that's interesting about this particular resource is that we actually don't seem to own much of it. And that's because we don't understand the value of data. Because what happens today is that we give our data away freely to game companies, to platforms like Facebook, or you know, Tencent, Twitter, all spaces. And these are all blocks of information. And then actually the platforms turn it into knowledge and create a very powerful network effect. And that actually becomes the valuable thing that these platforms have. The issue though is for us delivering this data, what do we get for it? We think it's fun. We think it's entertaining to use it, but in reality, we get nothing for it. And so effectively we are now living in a kind of digital colonialism where actually we are farming away our data for free and we give it to the likes of the Facebooks or the Epics or the game companies in the world who are making value of it. Perhaps one other way to think about it is that actually when you play, for all of you who are designing games, particularly in relation to this conference, when you're designing a game, especially free to play, one, one part of the audience is a free audience, which is the majority of your player base. And the other is the paying user base or paying in part or in large part because they can interact with all the free players. What happens if all the free players disappeared or no longer want to play that game? Will the people who are actually paying money continue to pay as much or anything at all? And the likely answer is less if at all, which means that the free people who are playing inside any free to play game actually already create a lot of value 
because they are part of the reason why people are paying money for it. And yet here we are spending all of our time playing these free games, but actually we don't get paid for it. Is that fair? And that's because we're surrendering our data because we don't understand what it's worth. And then a network effect is created. And that network effect is what they sell us advertising, services, you know, products or paid services. And it creates a scenario where today we're living in a world which basically is siloed with the data ownership in these sort of pre or early kind of metaverses, as we say, where we don't own anything, where the users who are playing these games actually are literally serfs in the kingdom of Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or Google or Tencent or any one of those experiences today. We actually don't own our data. This data is owned by them. And this is perhaps exemplified in another way by taking a look at the market caps of companies today versus at the market caps of companies, you know, basically, you know, a little, a little over 10, 15 years ago. And in fact, before they were all energy companies who were focused on oil and energy for the most part, right? And then, you know, we do have some retail in here. However, today, the vast majority of all the top companies in the world, they look like technology companies, they are, but what they really are, are data rich companies. And there'd be, you know, the trillion dollars of value comes in large part because of the fact that they're getting this resource, our data, our time entirely for free. And I think the other issue of course, is that you're creating a situation of world of have and have nots and this access of this resource, the ones who actually have access to the data and are able to manipulate and control it are the ones who will get to benefit from this and are in part creating a kind of an unequal society uh, that we're seeing right now. Now, why does non-fungible tokens and crypto and blockchain actually make all of this potentially different? And it starts with this paradigm of data because the non-fungible token as a platform, as a technology actually allows a user to truly own their data. And that's because it uses blockchain, meaning that this data does not reside in a server controlled by Facebook or controlled by Epic Games or controlled by Tencent. It resides in a public ledger, in the database that is owned by the commons, as it were, by a sort of community of users and a publicly operated node uh, sort of network that is distributed. And therefore, everyone has access to it and nobody really can remove what's in there. Meaning that the concept of the non-fungible token is more than just a scarce item. It is actually a scarce digital item that really confers true digital property rights upon the owner of this asset. Whether this is a painting, a cat image, a city JPEG, or other things, you now own it. And it allows for people to create new constructions on it because of the fact that you own it. Let me explain that a little bit. Non-fungible tokens we consider are open digital assets. And these open digital assets, they represent your data rights and they become composable on top of things in the same way that the platforms today compose on our data today. Remember, Facebook doesn't just take our data and do nothing with it. It takes our data and then it composes services on top of it and extracts value out of this composition and knows more about us and sells us advertising. It's just one example of that composability. If we don't have a benefit for that composability. But now when you have this data laid out in an open blockchain for anyone to see, you can freely compose on top of it a new product and service that actually then benefits the original owner of that asset. Much like what you've seen today in the simplest of terms, someone who created a digital piece of art as a non-fungible token and can, for instance, receive a continued royalty for having been the original creator of that asset. But I think we've seen this example of open composability in the past. And this is not just, you know, because it's the fact that it's an asset. Open composability, in fact, started in the digital world with code. And in fact, open source code is perhaps the perfect example of what open composability has done to the world of technology. And today, everything in the world is run by open source. Everything is developed on top of that. And it is the reason why the largest of corporations can no longer compete with a closed source environment where they can basically just code themselves uh, and sort of control the knowledge that's in there, they have to actually tap into open source because millions of coders have created the best code out there. And it's also the reason why a five or 10 person or a small startup can compete with a larger organization because he has the ability to access all of that code 
that was created through the wisdom of the millions of community people who've created better code. And the composability starts because someone may have created code for something very simple, and another person takes that code and manipulates it for its own purpose and puts it back into the community so that they can also benefit from it as part of the social contract. And for all of you here who are developing games, how many of you are actually really writing code from scratch? Or are you in fact composing code on top of someone else's code that you may have taken from open source or worked from within the company, for instance, that you're working or the startup that you've created? And in fact, that is the way that one can think about non-fungible tokens as well. And the fact that you can compose freely on top of it, except it is something that is now related to an asset. And what happens when you allow for open composability is essentially an ability to have an exponential ability to generate ideas and much more of a sharing environment because it's permissionless. Anyone has the freedom to manipulate that code any which way they like. And the original creator of the code does not have the ability to stop them. And in fact, the value of that original code increases in its utility because many more people maybe might be creating new things on top of it. And so this has given birth to this incredible technological revolution and the innovation that we have seen really in the last three or four decades in an exponential manner. But there's one difference here, which has been a bit of a problem. And one of the problems is that code is something that not most, not many people understand. The problem is that the vast majority of the world does not know how to interpret or manipulate code, no matter what we've been trying to do in the schooling industry. And many governments and education systems are trying to promote the usage of code, the learning of code. And yet here we are still, years and years after all of these attempts to get everyone to understand and sort of code and engineering, and we still don't do that because for the most part, it is something that we're not necessarily comfortable with. It is effectively like learning a new language. And we know what that's like. If you don't learn the culture, learning a new language like this may not seem natural. And so inadvertently, we have created a new kind of digital elite, the one that knows how to read and manipulate code. And they're basically the new kind of group of people who you know, have, have a sort of a disproportionate amount of power. In fact, if you consider it in a different way, you know, how much culture has code really delivered to us? You know, the way that we interface and interact with the interfaces in the digital world, the way we sort of navigate or even socialize is a construct of code today that we're basically following based on what someone else has designed from an engineering standpoint, from a software design point. So code really does run the world and is one of the most openly composable things in the world, um, but only a small number of people have benefited from this, comparatively speaking. When you take this concept into non-fungible tokens, the same element of composability, actually it broadens up. And the reason why is because not, you don't need to know how to code to participate in culture, meaning that you can now manipulate your assets and your services on top of something that you own as opposed to something that you have to sort of write code specifically on top in the digital context as it has been the case with open source. So let me describe that a little bit in the case of this car. And you know, with Rev Racing, for instance, we are the sellers and creators of digital cars. And yet the car itself is only a very small part of the entire automotive ecosystem. And in fact, the way to think of non-fungible tokens and is in, in terms of open assets and digital space is that they, much like in the physical world, become a platform of services and products on top of it. A car is not just something that you buy to drive and purchase. A car has become a platform. In fact, that platform is what fuels entire economies. If you think about the way that roads are being constructed, parking lots are being created, fuel economies are being designed, drivers that are hired, mechanics that are employed, right? In fact, so many people are now involved in the world of automobiles simply because you have the ability to own it and it, is not, it does not need permission from the likes of you know, Tesla or Volkswagen or Mercedes to be able to do something with it. Meaning that you can now openly compose. In other words, innovate on top of uh, sort of the car, independent of requiring permission from someone else and thereby also adding value. I'll give you an example that is one of my favorite ones which is the creation of the baby seat. The baby seat actually came three decades after the car was first created. And I can probably guarantee you that uh, when the car was first designed, 
you know, back by Henry Ford and some of the early pioneers in the car industry, they were not thinking about a transport mode for young children, because after all, young children are not likely to be able to know how to drive a car. But 30 years afterwards, you know, a small company, the Bunny Bear Company decided that they wanted to create a commercially, quasi-commercially great baby seat so that children could be transported comfortably and eventually safely from their destination because cars had become much more commonplace. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that the creation of this product had nothing to do with uh, sort of needing support or needing permission from the original creators of the car. It was done entirely independently. That's the first point. So innovation was able to come on top of it because it was an industry of people who owned cars. But the second thing I think, which is even more powerful, is that it led to eventual things like the seatbelt. And actually it added to the utility of the car because now the, you know, this, the car was a device, a sort of, you know, I guess utility item that had a value to families to transport children safely, as well as bringing sort of the adults from place to place. In other words, by adding that utility and that function, it not only made the asset more useful, it made it more valuable and also created a larger audience because now there was more utility towards it. And today you possibly, you know, certainly if you have a family, cannot imagine having a car without a baby seat or support for baby seat, meaning that they both inform of each other's value and they both created value for each other. And when you consider all the industries in the physical world today, actually they all compose this way. For instance, the ability for you to own real estate and to really own the property that we live in allowed for the creation of real estate agents or interior decorators, kitchenware, companies like Ikea. These are things that were only possible because we had the ability to own property. And those services that made our experiences better to own property, for instance, um, actually then made the property in and of itself more valuable because our usefulness of this improved because of the innovation of others. And this is really the history of innovation, you know, period. When you think about everything that's been constructed in the past. But in the digital world, everything is permissioned because the traditional closed loop model meant that when you play, for instance, a game, that asset cannot transfer. It can only stay inside the game. And in fact, it's rented, if it, as it were. You don't have an ownership it belongs to the game company. And if you ever wanted to use it for something else, you must all seek permission from the platform and essentially it becomes restrictive and very innovation unfriendly because you always need to seek permission. But in a decentralized blockchain-based uh, sort of uh, model where your assets exist in the, what we consider the true and open metaverse, they are free to go and travel everywhere they want, much like free trade of assets and items that we have in the physical world. And because you own it, it allows for a third party composition on top of it. For instance, right? If you have a virtual sword inside a game, it could be used in five or six different kinds of games, not just in your game, or it could be used for a fractionalization service, or it could be used to be lent against in lending protocol, or it could be mortgaged against. There could be a bunch of new services that people create on top of the fact that say that, that that person owns this asset. And so really what they're doing is developing and creating network effects, not just within the game itself, but within the asset itself. Meaning that every asset, much like the car example I gave earlier, becomes a platform. And in fact, the assets themselves become platforms that people can openly compose them. But it is only possible if you actually own that. So another example, for instance, in our own sandbox, you know, people sometimes find it interesting how you can actually buy virtual land. Well, in this case, virtual land is in fact something that you truly own on a game like the Sandbox. And in this particular case, you're free to compose on top of it. You can build your own experiences. You're free to sell it to someone else. You're free to collect rent and all the benefits that ownership confers upon you. And we think this is really critical that essentially this paradigm that we've seen before, you know, where the internet was really about information at first. And then with the advent of Bitcoin, basically it created a sort of, you know, you could say that Web3 created the internet of information, uh, so information in the internet of value. And now essentially with non-fungible tokens, you have this paradigm of ownership of things, of objects and assets 
and non-fungible tokens really deliver the internet of ownership where you can have and own a piece of your digital experience, your digital life, your digital self. And by buying virtual land, it is just one example of such a representation. But the other thing that makes the metaverse so important, particularly for all of us in the gaming industry, is that actually what was needed outside of this open infrastructure that is now being developed was a kind of banking system that didn't really exist before. We all, of course, have virtual coins inside a game that help sort of deal with a sort of fake economy that we have inside the ecosystem. But what we dubbed as called as the bank of DeFi, you have billions of dollars essentially locked in protocols that are accessible in an open manner that essentially become the banking infrastructure for all of these new metaverses that are out there. And without them, you know, the ability for you to own assets and to sort of create value for them may not be as powerful just as we have an existing closed economic system inside games because you don't have an open and transparent marketplace. And in fact, DeFi solves that as well. So now with non-fungible tokens, you have the objects and the assets and the things. And with the sort of, you know, um, DeFi and cryptocurrencies, you basically have, you know, a banking system that basically sort of creates an economy. So what is needed next, and this is what we think the future of games will definitely go towards, is the construction of the DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And what that really means is that the users who are the players inside your games actually become the owners of the game in some way, kind of almost like a voting right or like a citizen, if you were, within sort of your emerging country that is in fact your game. In fact, we think metaverses inside games are like the construction of countries. When you consider the games that you're building today, you are about constructing communities. You are about sort of building a society, as it were, even if it is a small one and creating value from that. And what happens with decentralized autonomous organizations is that it is no longer something that is controlled by a top level down company. It is in fact something that the community can make their own vo votes and their own sort of support around that. And because it's a blockchain, this contract lives forever. The moment that it gets issued on, on, on a public chain, you know, it basically lives forever, as it were, on, on, on the blockchain and, uh, and is unalterable. And you see some of those results were, you know, um, you know, these combinations of sort of the ownership of these assets inside games, together with the banking system that is delivered and the governance system creating sort of games such as Rev Racing or Axie Infinity, for instance, where, you know, millions of people are now playing games like Axie Infinity. In fact, they're the biggest blockchain game out there. And, um, you know, in a place like the Philippines, uh, you know, people are earning between 250 or $500 a month playing a game. And while that may seem maybe for traditional game developers a little crazy, actually all it's really doing is rewarding the time and the created network effect that these games do back to the people who contribute to that because that value was already in there. But you needed a banking system like DeFi and you needed essentially community ownership for that to be unlocked. And that is really one of the areas where, you know, that allowed for play to earn to be constructed, which we think is the future of work. Meaning that games in the uh, sort of in the future are not just going to be about fun. They certainly will continue to be fun and entertaining, but they are going to be the future of work and perhaps the future um, of for, for many of us in terms of its potential to sort of you know make a living or sort of have meaning and purpose. Uh, you know, and, and not just, and, and not just sort of, you know, fun where we give and surrender all the value to players out there. So, you know, Axie Infinity, as we sort of demonstrated what that's, that's done, were in places like the Philippines right now, there are more crypto wallets in rural Philippines than there is actually in, uh, than there's actually credit cards, for instance. So it's also created incredible uh, sort of financial inclusion as well. Now, you know, there's many more metaverses being built. Uh, we ourselves are currently involved in four directly outside of the ones that we're investing in, such as Sandbox and Gamey and Quid and Tower and then Rev uh, and Phantom Galaxies. But there's many other people that are developing the space. And I would say that the era of blockchain and NFT gaming, where you have ownership of these and actually are constructing a metaverse, no matter how big or small that may be, is sort of very similar to where we think mobile gaming was around 2011, 2012, right? And so we think the industry is still relatively sort of nascent in comparison.
the idea of owning virtual assets is actually not crazy. Every time we make a game and we use sort of our game economies for people to buy assets, the players actually think they own it. But in fact, they're renting. All of the assets that are being purchased inside online games today, if they're not on blockchain, for the most part, you're actually renting them. And so we think of this as a virtual rental community, right? a sort of a virtual rental environment right now inside all the games today. But that virtual rental environment is $100 billion a year and growing. And so what happens when you take a rental sort of a, a community that has been renting for most of their life and actually give them ownership and the ability to own it and thereby the benefits of an ownership economy as opposed to one of a rental economy? We think the paradigm will shift and change and the growth potential will be just as, it's just as big, equivalently large as we went from rental to ownership in the physical world. And we've seen what that means, meaning that is also the reason why assets grow in value because now you can confer the benefits of that ownership, you know, in terms of long-term yield, in terms of long-term ownership benefits, just in the same way that when you buy a property, for instance, you want to consider the long-term benefits and therefore give it a future value because of the fact that you know that you can get a return from that. That's basically what is happening in the world of, um, of blockchain gaming and these open metaverses. And I'll conclude essentially with this little sort of image as a thought here, which is that many of the largest companies today, we think they know what the true and open metaverse is about, which is the one that where we have ownership of our data, where we own sort of, you know, our digital assets. And by owning our digital assets, we own basically our data and with that, our freedom in the digital world. But that also means it's very different from the business models today where the network effect is not shared, where the network effect in fact is owned by the platform. Facebook today, for instance, despite them calling themselves meta, owns our network effect entirely. And actually their business would be terribly disrupted if all of us suddenly had ownership. But think about it for a moment. In this world, should we not own our data? Should we not be paid for the value that we're giving to companies like Facebook or for the games we're playing? And so I guess for all of us here who are thinking about making games in this new paradigm, it is less about thinking about how we can take value from the players and make more money from them, which is kind of what we see somewhat in this image of the potential of what a future metaverse in a very dystopian way might look like but rather what can we give back to the users for fair value in a kind of community and society where every game is an open and true metaverse where the players can have real ownership of the assets and can have their freedoms in the world and have a stake and a vote in its future. Thank you very much.